So you need to you can go through, please raise your hand. And I want to stop right in there because it may be a question that six other people have, and I can answer that on the spot. You don't have to wait for the end. Just let me know as you go through. You're going to see some information on the screen that uh, may be a little bit hard to read, and I've already been asked about that. Um, some maps and some things like that. So if you want particular pieces out of this, uh, I have a sheet of paper in the back, and back in the corner back there. Just get your email on there, and I can email you that piece of the presentation behind because there's some very useful information in there as we go through the, uh, what I have to show you. Uh, this is, I uh, always like leaving this up. This is a very special trip that, that we took uh, not too long ago in the San Francisco. And um, it doesn't, doesn't have any water in the picture. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about doesn't have anything to do with water. It has everything to do with being on the landscape. Getting through the water. And going home from me. Having a hand of serious here. Uh, I've got a lot of other pictures that have my face and screens and all of that. But this one really, um, in a nutshell, is what a lot of this is about. And that's about being here and, and having that serious amount of all that. Um, the guy in this picture happens to sit at the table back there, my rather important shot. Um, so let's get to it. And uh, I came up with this short slide a few years ago. And, uh, really, it, you know, what I'm getting at is there's three survival in the tribe. Survival is just sweeping by, right? Maybe it's sweeping by enough to save your own skin and, and run. Survival is a whole different world. Survival is where you feel at home in the backcountry. You've gained some basic skills that you built. Um, you've got a knowledge base that you can use to you feel very, very comfortable and home in the back of the And that's the tribal, that's what tribal means here. And so a lot of us that you're going to see tonight involves survival and not survival, not just sleeping by, but being comfortable in the back of the tree to uh, you and feel like you're home. Okay? And you're going to see some ways you can do that. So survival involves taking things to the next level. And some questions that I ask myself too is, you know, why why would I why would I want to go into that and work so hard at the kitchen point? Why would I do that so many things? Um it's gonna be pretty obvious in what I talk about here. Um I'm gonna talk about scouting for water and some tools you can use to make scouting from home possible. Okay, save you some water. <laughs> I'm also gonna talk about here. And uh, share what I've learned over decades of uh, distilling here down to what actual resorts. Um, and you're going to see that I'm going to talk about types of gear, not necessarily, hey, here's one model of GPS that you should buy. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to talk about GPS in the navigation, but don't say you're such a loosely budget with technology these days that I can't really do that. So we're going to touch on that, but I'm going to talk about here um, some fly fishing techniques. We're going to talk about fly, fly fishing gears, tackle, terminal tackle, um, how to get further in, and then how to protect the reef when you are out the back of the river. So, the first thing I want to talk about here on why going to the backcountry, um, and hopefully, you can read this start uh, from where you're sitting. So this is where I started out in 1963 in Denver. Okay. And in Colorado, we had about 1.9 million people living in our state. Where are we at now? You live in the biggest city in our state, right? You know where we're at right now. And we'll have we're probably close to six million by now with over six million people. Okay. How many of you have been to fishing spots? That you fished 30, 40 years ago, but you can get it again. You can relate to that. That's one of the reasons I gave the backcountry. And even the backcountry is getting crowded in some places. Okay? It kind of feels like the, the fur trade area of the mountain, man, and they kept having to push farther and farther in to get away, right? That's kind of 
kind of how I feel sometimes. And so the back country gives you an offer um, to, to get away from the crowds and uh, to enjoy your experience out there on the water. But this is one of the biggest reasons why the back country is such a great option uh, for everybody. <laughs> That's a seller not out here, Sad. Anybody been to the top of that going? It, uh, it looks like that almost every day. And I grew up about 10 miles from that peak. And uh, I can tell you that, and this is the parking lot I'm talking about that, but it's been there recently. Okay. How many of you avoid it? Okay. So yeah, I can relate to that. Okay. This is closer to the back country. But this is what things are looking like. Top of the most half, you put out there about a whole lot of trail. And it looks very much like this. So, um, getting into the back country, getting into the outback, gives you a way to get away from that. Um, here's a snapshot of Colorado wilderness. And these are federally designated wilderness areas in Colorado. And we're very, very lucky to have what we have um, in our state. Uh, we've got over 3 million acres of federally designated wilderness. Uh, a lot of this holds fish in the water. Most of it does. Um, we've got 41 of those wilderness in um, This is one of those slides that if you want it, let me know which name on this back there, and I can share that with you. Um, it doesn't go into great detail. I mean, it's one of these, but it shows you where these are spread out. Most of the uh, Federally designated wilderness in Colorado is in Alpine Terrain, Rock, a lot of public land that you may not have known about. Okay, so this is higher elevation. Most of this is, you know, eight, nine thousand feet above. Okay, but the next thing I want to show you is where. All of these BLM world and sunny areas are at. Anybody familiar with BLM? Anybody in that thing? Okay, good. For the rest of you, this holds a lot of potential for fish in the water. Okay, and if you look at this, this is spread out over lower elevation, but some of this will hold fish in the water, especially when you get down to the south end of Colorado, the Huron. Um, there's some more over here on the other property plateau, the Colorado plateau. There's a lot of um, a, a lot of land in the, the BLM wilderness study area, and this this offers you a really good opportunity to explore in the whole new state. But outside of that, those are the that in the wilderness category. Okay, WSA managed just like federal wilderness. Okay. If you want to think of them as wilderness areas in windy, that's really what they were. But a lot of people think that we have seen the in my hand for about 30 to 40 years now. So um, there's not a lot of them that you can go into federal wilderness, but they're managed very much the same way. While I'm on the map, I'm also going to show you how Colorado Parks and Wildlife is divided up into uh, districts and offices. Um, this is another slide I can share with you because I actually have the, the contact info for every one of these districts on this map. This gives you a really useful tool, and you're going to see when I start talking about crowding for the water, how useful Colorado Parks and Wildlife can be in those areas. But these are regional offices, and each one of these um, gives you a chance to um, scout the water, to talk to uh, biologists. I've got another tweet for biologists. Um, it's a very, very useful resource. And there's a list of resources that you'll see as I'm going to this that give you a chance to uh, really have an advantage in the scouting for fish in the water, saving miles and feet. And um, and finding new places for the back end of the trip. And again, if you want to you want this map, I can try to put it here with you. Um, once you uh, once you find a 
first of all, our community law person is also going to be gay one to attend that briefing, okay? And they can get in contact with them. But there's certainly a very, very useful uh, resource in terms of finding law. So talking about scouting resources, and I'm just going to start at the top left and kind of go around clockwise. Uh, I'm kind of old school. I didn't grow up with the internet. Um, <laughs> I had to go down to the forest service and get 7.5 minute quad maps that we paid about $2 at the store, and I'd sit at home and play with these maps as a youngster. Um, there's still a a scouting resource for you guys if you want to do it that way, and that's at that, that Denver too. Um, that has the entire city of Colorado on um, very large scale top traffic maps for the entire state. Anybody have that in the truck? Okay. When all else fails, right? Your batteries die, this will still work. And uh, you're going to see that I, I do like to. To go back old school once in a while because these things don't break. They take care of them, they don't break the battery cover or not. So that is a very useful value tool in large scale. If you give you the big picture, you really can't distill things down to you know, um, very small scale, but it's very, very useful. Um, game wardens that have to be on the game warden and you know, clean the city area. Those guys are out there all the time, and, and I can tell you that our game warden uh, in our district talks to anglers all the time. He stops them, he checks licenses, he talks to them about what's going on, but they also know what's going on in the back country. These guys are in contact with fisheries biologists all the time, and the fisheries biologists are a golden retriever, especially when it comes to the back country. So, game wardens are a big resource for you. Uh, guidebooks. And I've been tempted to write a guidebook on Colorado backcountry for a long time, and I struggle with that because I wrestle with telling people where to go fish. I really wrestle with that. Okay? Um, I'm not going to do that tonight, by the way. Um, I'm not going to tell you exactly where to go fish. Um, I think part of the experience is in finding those places and, 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 and investing your time in scouting. Uh, so I'm not going to hot spot anything tonight, but I can tell you that um, guidebooks are also very, very useful. And that's an excellent book. There's one for the Bahino, uh, for Indian Feed School, and there's all kinds of guidebooks out there. So those can, those can be very useful, but just know that they can also contain a lot of dated material once you have that book you want, if that makes sense, okay? Um, but but they, they, they're very useful. There's our fly shop, and I can tell you that a, a local fly shop is also another day game. Um, we stay dialed in on our water all the time. Okay. Um, I'm guiding, I'm looking at a fly shop, I'm interacting with customers. Um, however, everybody who comes in that, that fly shop that has been on the water, I'm talking to. Okay. I have people coming in from some great crystals from back country, I'm talking to them. And are constantly soaking up information. And I can tell you that quite often there's as much information coming to us as there is what we're dishing out. In fact, so it's like that stop in that local flight stop. It's take dialed in all the time. The clients are getting them see that, the guides are getting them see that. Okay. So don't hesitate to use that when you scout into the water. Um, down on the bottom row, there's a couple of online or uh, technologic resources that I highly recommend that you use. And I'm going to start with Onyx. Okay. Onyx is a su subscription based app. Um, state of Colorado, the whole state of Colorado costs around $20 a year, which is a drop in the bucket with the amount of information you get. Um, Onyx has several different platforms. I use the, the, the Hunt map. I'm also a hunter, but one of the things that Onyx will do for you is it will identify public and private lands. And on the public lands, it will give you landowner information. It'll give you landowner's name. It'll give you landowner's tax mailing address. Uh,
I mean, you actually you might not want to fish that water now that is right, but it may be a new accent. Um, there's also importance inside public lands with people who tried to pop in there as well. Um, so it's possible for anybody to move on and actually find every one of your properties on for your field information. Okay. And that's all fed by county receptors and that whole thing. That's what we get. Okay. Very, very useful. But it also keeps you with it. And the guides we use on X all the time because we have to say it. Okay. First thing on the Arkansas River where there's a path with the public and private land. But Onyx is very useful. The other thing that Onyx is going to do is it will allow you to, to download maps and use that app, that platform, without a cell phone. All right? You can download maps, and you've got a couple, a couple different size maps that you can download, and you can pull those up on your phone in the back country without a cell phone. You can also know a great platform. Both offline and online. So by now, when I've had my online for about four or five years, but you if you have a big picture of North America, you can see all the places I hang out. Okay, the entire middle of Colorado looks like one red blob because there's so many wave plants stacked there. Okay, it's very very useful. Um, if I were to pick any of the tools that are on the screen right now that I use the most, it would be on it. But I don't get paid to tell you that. Um, very, very useful. You can share waypoints as well. Uh, John and I probably share two or three a week. Um, he's out all the time, popping waypoints and working stuff and turning it to right, So, very useful. Anybody here to use it? I'm not good for you. Do you agree? It's useful. It's awesome. Uh, Coach Rex. Coatrex is a um, topographic mapping platform. It complements Onyx. Coatrex does not have landowner information. And that's one of the biggest differences. Um, I don't use Coatrex a lot, but I have it on my phone. Um, one thing that I do enjoy about Coatrex is it has probably the most complete trail inventory of any online platform in Colorado that I know of. It's got all of, all of the trails on it. We all know like the trail numbers, four of the trail numbers on it. It's very complete. It's actually more complete as far as trails go than, than on it. So, so it kind of complements each other. Uh, one thing that you're going to see on the tools that I use, whether it's here or whether it's scouting resources, um, I like to have more than one egg in a basket because there is no perfect. Scouting resource is no perfect piece of gear. So you're going to find that your gear with scouting resource, oftentimes having more than one tool that complements each other. Okay? And you can use it if you don't see it together. But um, some very useful things too. And I don't use them all of those all the time, but I use all of them some of the time for sure. Okay. This is uh Another scouting resource that I, I mentioned earlier, your fisheries biologists, all of the wildlife fisheries biologists. This map right here has points of contact for every fishery, uh, chief fisheries biologist in state of Colorado. Okay, and this is something I can share with you. Um, these positions, these people change from time to time, but this is fairly recent. And it will at least get you the right phone number, but most of, I would say 90% of these are probably still the same. They haven't changed personnel. Okay. These fishery biologists can give you information on stocking programs to high lakes. Okay. Um, they also can give you information on winter fill on high lakes, which is a big deal. I've, I've hiked many miles before to find a dead lake. We just did this the other day. Um, a lake that I had never fished, so I fished it and said it was great. We got up there and it was totally there. Okay. It had an algae thing going on, an algae problem going on. Um, these biologists also are always looking for input in anglers as well. And something that we do on a routine basis when we're in the backcountry, we come back home, they, they call these guys, send me an email, 
and give them an update on our experience on food and also on highway. Okay, so if you like that, I can send that to you. But these strictly biological for hinge resources, one of the most important ones I think, um, especially with um, stocking and with winter Okay. Uh, they also have some some stocking programs going on uh, in progress right now, and I don't know if any of you are tuned in to what's going on in progress this but they're trying to reintroduce genetically pure real grand cutthroats down there. And so we're cleaning out all of the, the other cutthroats and, and get them out of there, right? And um, being able to contact, in that case, um, Alex Townsend, who's the history biologist, to get an update on the progress of that project. It's pretty useful information. Okay. Um, so, fishery biologists, big deal. Very good resource for you. Okay, I'm going to shift here a little bit and I'm going to talk about gear. Does anybody have any questions about anything I talked about so far? Anything at all? Yes, sir. I think Coliston looks like they have got a fish comes in for the extended cow. The answer is no. Okay. So they don't make it easy. Um, and I, to my knowledge, they don't, they're not inventorying those good ways. Um, but I do know this, that um, those biologists will know within their region, based on input from anglers, okay? Because that's the only way they get it. Typically, those guys don't have enough time to go out and fish themselves. That's been my experience. So they're getting, Feedback from anglers or hikers or backpackers or climbers on the status of what it's going on, but they're keeping track of their distance. But to my knowledge, on the state level, I don't know if anybody's cataloging that and making it public. They may be keeping track of it, but it's it's not public information. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering if the resources. I've had clients use it. Yeah, I I have not. No, yeah, I haven't used it. It's very similar to, in a way, it's similar to Onyx, but I don't think it, it won't give you randomly food status. And um, it wasn't enough to use it like Onyx yet. I would like to check it out though, enough, but I've had clients that had on the phone phone, and uh, we found it very useful. We've had customers send us live out to them. So, yeah. Yes, um, it, it, there's no blanket regulation on it. So I do know that, you know, in the fishing regulation brochure each year, in the back, all of the special regulation waters is actually indexed in the back of that. And so um, that's where you would look. The other place you can check with would be your local game one or the fishery biologist. But all of that special regulation water, whether it's moving water, streams and rivers, or still water, it's going to be in the back of that ocean if it has special regulation. Um, so I feel like that's a non answer, but it's not an easy answer. You know, we have people coming to the fly shop all the time, they want to know how many fish they can feed. That's not an easy answer either, right? So, um, Colorado is fairly complicated state in the country. Any, any other questions so far? What's down here? All right, I'm going to talk about here. And I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to stand here and tell you, hey, this is the food you need to buy because I guarantee you in two years it's not going to exist, right? Because the companies are going to change and drive you crazy. Um, but you're going to see the type of food. Now, I'm going to talk about the type of food. Okay. And I'm going to focus on that, not on particular brands or models or anything like that. I got an interesting story about those boots <laughs> while I'm here. So uh, I did a caribou hunt in Alaska a few years ago. And it's so wet up there that you have to wear waders and waders and stuff. That's how wet it is. Heavy. And um, that boot actually saved my foot. Uh, we were trying to pull a caribou carcass from underneath about 300 pounds of, of mud that a grizzly bear piled on top of it because we were trying to eat my bowl after I killed it. And uh, I actually shoved a, a tiny 
off of the antlers on my pole through the side of that boot and into my foot about 200 miles from here in town. And uh, the lining in that boot kept that, that antler from penetrating my foot. So I love those boots, I still have it. <laughs> and there's a hole right here with the with the story attached to it. So weird stuff. So the first thing I want to talk about is waders. Um, full backcountry, okay? Um, I'm surprised that more people don't know about hip waders, okay? Some do, but I get a lot of funny looks out when I'm guiding them. You know, where do you get those? How do they work? If it's an obvious question, but I come to ask that. And so on a lot of water, waiting pants for camp waders are absolutely ideal. And chest waders are not even appropriate for what you go. Okay. I prefer hip waders mainly because they I get a lot more ventilation in their waiting pants. It's it's reasonably warm down where we are in southern Colorado. Um I've been wearing that particular brand for a long time. There's a two or three brands out there of, of hip waders, and that's about it. You don't have much protection. But they all work basically the same. They're very lightweight. Um, you can roll these up and stick them in a backpack very easily. Um, I, I do prefer hip waders over um, waiting pants, certainly, but waiting pants can work as well. But chest waders, um, just really aren't what are appropriate, appropriate for most of the back and say you can fit. Um, we can wet wade, and I don't have a, an image of that, but we do a lot of wet wading down front of Colorado. Um, you can pull that off on the front range as well during, during the summer. Uh, it, and it's much more comfortable than wearing a pair of chest waders. And you got you have to keep this in mind all the time, but you know how much extra weight are you going to put on your bottom to spin? A day and five or six miles on the water, right? You have to, your body has to carry all that stuff. And it may not seem like much when you put a pair of chest waders on, but it adds up very, very quickly with weight. In fact, so I'm always thinking about, well, how much does that weigh? Because this whole body has to carry it around. So that's one of your choice. Um, let me go back to this real quick. So boots, again, um, I like to have a wading boot for the backcountry that's built like a, a hiking boot. Because quite often I'm hiking as much as I'm waiting, maybe even more. Okay? I do hike in my boots and in my ship boots. I'm not changing when I get there, I'm not taking them off, and then hiking out with it. I'm not taking two pairs of shoes. I'm wearing these all day. And so again, when you think about that, I'm gonna spend eight to 10 hours, five to six miles wearing this stuff. That helps you make some decisions on what kind of gear you're gonna have, okay? You can see these boots, and like I said, they're my, they're my favorite boots now because they save my foot, but they also have um, plenty of ankle support, which you can use. Um, they have replaceable laces. Okay. The one decision I made a long time ago when Boa Lacey came out was that I wasn't going to take any of the I had to fix one of those things in the fly shop on time on the counter, and that was enough for me. Okay. So I like having the laces because they have a very easy to change the lace out, right? You pop it in the and then I don't want to sit there and try to deal with Boa Lacey. I don't even have to Okay. Nothing gets Boa's, right? But I don't want to be back that you have to deal with that. So I'm going to have lace. Um, this particular group is mostly leather, and uh, the one I have now is as well. But there's some great lightweight um, weighted boots options out there for you. Um, but again, just keep in mind that you're going to have to wear those at home. Are you Absolutely. I've actually backed that. In the back. Okay. That's really good. No, they're they're uh, they're they're the same thickness as uh a pair of waiters. 
all the other questions. I can put if the regular people on five millimeters to Okay. Um, and I'll I'll put a pair of socks in the pack that I can wear again. This is what I'm wearing. The alternative is to take multiple pieces of footwear that came in and out of And again, that, that's more the way. The only difference between the gear it takes to spend two or three nights out and a day on the water is basically food and shelter. Everything else is going to be the same. Okay. Um, this is a day pack. This is for a half day or a full day out on the water. This is not for an overnight. I need a bigger pack for an overnight because I'm going to have more food and I'm going to have shelter in bed. So this is just for a day. Um, I found that the size day pack that I usually arrive at is somewhere between 1,800 and 2,400 cubic inches. Okay. I've got one. You grab that, that green pack and just hold it up right there. That's about the size of what I carry. Okay. There's a reason it's that big. I see people out in the back empty. Thank you. I see people out in the back empty all the time. All the way up to there. Okay. I have used my first aid kit that's in this pack on other people way more than I used it on myself. And the reason I did that is because they didn't have it. They didn't have arrangements. Okay. So that's kind of the size of my need up here. Okay. I'm going to break this down for you. Here's what's inside it. Okay. I always take a rain though. I don't care if the forecast says zero percent chance of rain. It's going in the pack. Okay. Looks like an American Express thing. Um, extra layer, depending on the time of year. And then again, not put that for a shade kit. It's not enough to have a first aid kit. You got to know how to use it. Okay. And I'm not going to get into first aid training and all that stuff right now tonight, but you, you have to know what's in it. You have to know how to use that stuff. Okay. I like to build my own because then I know exactly what's in it because each piece I had to check out and select. Um, got a pair of gloves up there. Gloves are very, very useful. Okay. If you don't have these same tools on the end of your arm, they're functional, and you could get yourself in some trouble, right? And you protect your hand. So I always have gloves with me. I've got some navigation devices, which is a satellite device and a compass. Again, I've got some redundancy because the GPS or battery can fail, the GPS can break. The compass is a little hard and kind of difficult to mess up. Possible pouch. Um, I think I've got a slide here to break that down, but that's. Um, that's on man bed. <laughs> and it's got some cool stuff in it. Necessary thing. Everything that I have has a has a job to do here. Okay. If you look, I have a pot of soap. That's pretty handy because I like to fish in the cold. And I can make some tea, I can take lunch, I can have some hot tea on a cold day. Okay. And it's very compact and it fits in the pack. That's what's in the pack. I also wear a chest pack. This is what it looks like. Here's the contents of my chest pack. And it has a lot of my fishing gear in it. Um, you can tell on the guy because I carry like way more equipment than I probably should. Okay. Uh, I've got some tools. I have a water filter right here. Okay. Those so little portable water filters are two on small bladders and one of the best investments you can have. I will carry water. I'm standing in a bazillion gallons of water all day long. Why would I carry water? I can carry filters and I can drink as I go. Um, I've got all my tools for fly fishing here. Um, small fly box. This is this little setup is going around the car uh, as well. So I've got my guitar lines on there. But that those are the contents of that fish stuff. That I like that I like chest packs. One simple reason is everything I need is just right here. I don't have to take my pack off to get anything out. My tools are right there. Um, on certain things, it's it's acceptable. Okay. Yeah. 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 
Here's some gear that I wear. Okay. I always have a watch. Got a knife right here, same knife, big lighter. Um, that's the fire starter, GPS. Push it up a little bit here and talk about our audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's there you go. All right. Um, I have found, and I've been doing, I've been guiding Tim Carter for years. Um, I was using it before that. Most of the water I fish is absolutely perfect. I don't need anything more than that. Okay. Um, I don't need real. I'm going to be fishing all day long. If I had more, I'd be fishing for plenty of years all day long. Right. I don't need a line. It's absolutely perfect. Um, on in front of rods, and it, there's kind of a collection here. These are all rods that I fish with, but the ones that I really like are the ones in the middle because they're the shortest flat the length of all the rods that I have. And they're very easy to, to store in the pack. They'll even store them behind my test pack in a slot I have behind the test pack when they don't stick out on the side like a handle them. So, uh, very useful tool. I'm not trying to make anybody a convert. But it sure makes a lot of sense. The car lines are also very compact. Um, they fit on a small stool, and that's all you need. Okay? Again, it's about weight, it's about compactness, and how easy it is to use it. Okay, Western fly rocks. Most of the time, the water I'm on, I'm somewhere between a three and a five weight. Sometimes I take two rods. Sometimes they take the rest of the rod and they take the rod. Quite often, the fishing high lakes, but I'm also fishing the outlet to those high lakes, and that's where the cold fire comes in, very useful. Okay. Now, um, I'm really end up fishing, if I'm using Western fly rod, a four way, three way, or a four way fly dip. Okay. Um, I have a six foot, nine inch, three way that I love. It's a very old rod. Um, and it's just about the right way for you to tight frames, a lot of vegetation is very handy. Um, getting up on high lakes, you need a little bit more rod. Typically, it's windy up there. Last high lake I took, I took a five way because I was kind of anticipating that one. Four weight is okay, but you get in heavy wind and the four way has really trouble fishing the other one, especially if you fish the last one. And I'm using all of these way for the lines, of course. Any questions? Any questions on gear? On gear selection? The things that I have to like that. I got a bunch of questions that I take tomorrow, but maybe I'll save them until later. But the biggest one is equating Tenkara action to a Western rod action. You know, fly rods. Medium, 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 medium. So, yeah, I get asked that a lot. I get asked a lot. And there really isn't, I can't tell you this rod is a total, this rod is a five weight, and so on. But it's more about flex. Right. That's what I'm asking more about the flex yeah. than the casting. Yeah. Stuff. And, and, and I could say this, and, now, and I'll answer any questions we have later specifically, but I like to have a tip flex to the part of the rod for back of the meaning that the bend in that rod is out in the tip. Okay. So if it was a western fly rod, I'd be saying I, I like a little fast rod. Yeah. Okay. And the reason for that is when yeah. okay. it's not that I'm throwing big flies because I usually am not. It's all about when. It's about line length and when. Yeah. So there are no fast converters, but there are tip flex. Tip flex. Okay. Yeah. And if you're familiar with the, the flex ratings, I would want a 6 4 or 7. A 6 4 or 7. Four. But I can give you that. So, a great question. I'm going to ask for a lot. Any other questions on gear? Is anybody using the same way different than what I have on the screen? Okay. No one hears it. Uh, protecting the resource, and I can go back to this. Um, 
There's, there's really no substitute for planning ahead and preparing. You know, I gave you a lot of tools that you can use for scouting the home. Okay, that's part of planning ahead and preparing. But also know you're here. Um, Stay organized. Okay. Also planning ahead and preparing in the back end when you're telling someone where you're going and then not changing that plan. There's all kinds of folks who get lost in Colorado. Some even die because they didn't tell anybody where they went. And if they did, they would change their plans and they went somewhere else. It's hard for people to go look for you if they don't know where you're at. Okay. So I always do this with my wife at home. Um, I tell her exactly what I'm doing. Okay. Um, and then I don't I don't deviate that. If I do, I send her a uh, a message on my uh, WAMs, okay, which is another tool that you've got at your disposal. Um, traveling and camping on the river surface is an act. It, it kind of drives me nuts at times in the backcountry when I see the kind of damage that people do to, to the backcountry. Okay. Um, Fire rage. Okay. Don't go do fire rage. I don't know the last time where I broke a fire range and used it for any practical purpose. I've got a I've got a camp stove. I have a um, an ultra light wood stove that goes in that camp. I don't need a fire range. And Colorado doesn't need any more fire range. Mm -hmm. These are ones that are already out there. Okay. And if you see one that's really old. Take it apart and just get rid of it. Okay. Um, disposing of your waste properly. Okay. Pack it in, pack it out. Um, there are actually um, established guidelines on leaving no trace in the backcountry. If you Google leave no trace, you'll get all of them. There's distances you need to do away from trees um, with the toilet and all of that. Um, but disposing of waste. And, and Sean and I have this, this running joke about people and, and dog food and dog food bags, right? Um, along the trail. Everybody's seen it, right? Well, the, the same thing happens with toilet paper in the back. Of you. It does not go away quickly. And um, so pack it in, pack it out. Leave what you find, and there's all kinds of regulations for what you can and can't take out of the back country. Um, but leave it to find and try to leave every place you go better than it was when you got to. Um, almost every trip I'm out, whether I'm guiding or I'm out on my own, I'm, I'm tapping track. Right? And I'm sure you guys do the same when you're out there. And if it wasn't necessary, they do it. Then, while you can't fire the packs, check the fire bands. I can tell you that when I was growing up, we didn't even think about fire bands. They didn't even do them, I don't think. Um, they didn't even put them in place, and now it seems like we have fire bands more often than not because of the drought we've been in for the last two decades. So, check the fire bands. Most county uh, sheriff offices will have fire band information on, but the federal agencies like the DLM and the Forest Service will have fire band on their website as well. Um, and be considerate of others. Uh, I've had a few times in the backcountry where uh, backpacked in the fish and had people come in and camp like almost right on top. Okay. Um, so just be considered of others in the backcountry. Um, and, and, and know your space and give people space. That's why they're out there to begin with. Some ways to protect the resource when you're out there. A few more things here. Um, know your limits. Okay. Know your limits. Know the limits of the people who are with you. And I learned this lesson uh, early on in my guidance group about knowing people's limits and not getting them asked what they are capable of doing. But the same thing is for you. Um, use your equipment wisely. Um, do a ton of research. Research is free. Um, but make your choices on, on here. Um, one of the things that I do. Before a, a any trip, as I think about, you know, what do I, what do I want to accomplish that day? What do I want to accomplish that weekend or that week? And kind of think about that and set some ex expectations for the trip. Um, and then when you're finished, 
But I keep talking to what you're doing at that time. I keep telling you that every time I go out, I learn something new and different about my experience. And I keep track of that. I keep the journey. Um, this is the big, really important thing about planning your activities around your building. Okay. Um, that country doesn't have to be 10 miles in the buildings. There's plenty of that country that's successful at the, any skill level. Okay. Um, so think about your own limitations and the people that are with you. And then, like I said, when you get back out and get home, um, think about the trip, set some goals for the next time. Um, it may help you make some better choices on gear. It may help you make some better choices on where you go. So you can kind of evaluate that trip after you get back. Speaking of disposing human waste, and this is a kind of a soapbox, but it's so important with as many people as we have in our state now that you know how to do this. Um, and this is for day trip as well as the backpacking trip. For example, uh, you need to have those at least 200 feet away from uh, water sources from the camp. Six to eight inches deep, but typically what I'll do is I'll bring the cat hole and scout in and actual dirt. We get into a lot of places where there's pine dust or the first six to 12 inches, but right? you need to get down to actual dirt. In Colorado, it's easier to find that because it's got rocks in Okay, so you get down to the rocks. Um, make it so nobody else can see it. Um, keeping that slight from sunny slot that helps. Everything break down bigger than it gets in the Um Toilet paper, wet wipes, dirty mouth. Take a big ziplock, take a wicked and dirty stuff out. Uh, toilet paper does not break down as fast as you think it is. Tampons and pack them out as well. Um, those are the triathlon wipes. Um, and just pack everything, everything you want in, pack it out. You'll find that you can only get packing out for the people as well. Here's some ways to minimize campfire impacts. This is actually called, I don't know if anybody knows what these are, but it's called a bridge land trail. And it burns pine cones, it burns elk poop, it burns twigs, anything that's combustible, this thing is burned. And what's cool about it is you have an unlimited fuel resource, right? You'll never run out of fuel. Um, and it fits inside the pot right here, so it works really well. I use that thing a lot. Uh, doesn't involve a, a higher rate at all. You can just set it right down on the dirt. Um, gas stove in the middle. Um, besides when this is a lot slower than a fat uh, gas stove. So, like coffee, I don't want to wait on coffee. Right? Coffee waits on me, I don't wait on coffee. So I'm going to use gas stove and stuff like that. Um, and then I have the, I'm fortunate enough to have a ultra light backpackable wood stove that goes inside my, my shelter. Okay. Again, there's not a um, star of the ground at all. Um, starting from that, when you set ash down, there's nothing but just power. Okay. So there's a lot of alternatives out there um, other than a camp. There's another. Um, and I can leave this up at the end and you can take a picture of that. Here's some places you can get away to info. My blog, I have a lot of information on my blog and car tracks, trips I've taken, um, gear that I've used, that I've written about. Um, there's a ton of stuff on there. Most of it is geared towards the backcountry. Um, all of the parts of wildlife, again, a huge resource player um, as far as. Um, or, uh, fishing regulations, hunting regulations as well, but um, points of contact throughout the state for biologists and, and um, game workers. There is a leave no trace link right there if you want to take a look at how to use some of those things to keep things clean in the backcountry. On X uh, and co tracks. And I'll leave that up. I'll put it back to it at the end so that's up there where you can take pictures of. It's a very useful set there. Uh, my YouTube channel is also called Tracks, and there's some things on there as well that 
I think you probably would have joined with some good information for us. And lastly, here's the thing I do at work every day. Um, my husband did what he was saying. A new guy, um, backcountry trips for our business. Um, after we pulled the backcountry trips, I also do a two day, one night rolling trip. And that's really made a very important difference. We have issues with getting out the backcountry and doing a boat ride or something like that. And then the know how to pull that off themselves. And um, I do. Three or four days a year for that very reason. Um, I am hosting a trip to Alaska next year. If you're interested in hearing more about that, I've got um, a sign up sheet for back if you want more information on that. I'm hosting a trip in September of next year to the Bristol Bay area of Alaska. Um, one of the best times of the year to go. That's why I've got some people there right now. And they're not here. Um, normally, I've gone in June. I usually take between seven and eight clients up with me. Um, have a wonderful time, and they stick it up. I'm actually heading to Labrador with, with Sean next year with a big work crowd, so I had to kind of switch up the schedule. So we're going in September uh, next year. Um, and then I also uh, deal with some good product products. We are a dragon tail for a dealer at our shop. Um, and I also design and build uh, three quality lines, both clothing and mental lines of my own design that we offer at that. Um, and I've got some, some brochures out on the table that have a web address on there doing the interviews of the things I have in the screen. Um, I think at the end of this, I've got some pretty cool photos and things that we've done. Oh, I want to talk about this real quick too. I, if you want an extension of what I talked about tonight, it's, it's all hands on. I'm doing a backcountry clinic um, just outside of Canyon City on October um, 24th. Excuse me, that could be 21st. It is October 21st. I can't realize it's October 21st. Um, October 21st is Saturday. Uh, we're going to do that one water at a remote location. It's easy to get to just outside of Canyon City. And really putting the play of all the things that I see on the screen, we're actually going to get our, our feet wet, our hands burning, and, and go through some, some back up and stuff down there. That's going to be an all day affair on Saturday, October 21st. So if you're interested in that, I've got an information sheet in the back that you can get me your, your contact info so I can go ahead and, and, and share that with you. Um, so that's coming up. That's going to be a lot of fun. It's a great time to be out of the day. We've got questions. Here's a couple of pictures from the camp. This is down in uh, South San Juan, South San Juan Wilderness. That was uh, a few years ago. Another picture from the High Lake um, in the War Range. We've got questions. Anything at all? And have the answer to the question. Okay. So, are your backpacking trips with a one guy thing? Yes, two days and one night. Is that with a week or so? Is everybody packing with everything? We got bottles and what, what's that look like? Yeah, so here's what it looks like. Everything that you have, you can put in on your back. Okay, it's a backpacking trip. Um, I have all the camp gear, so I'm carrying shelter, food. Uh, so all, all of the collective camp gear I've got on my back. So basically, we're carrying your personal gear, rain gear, your bed, your sleeping bag, your pad, and that type of thing. So, so you've got a light pack. Okay. So it's you and me, not. I can take. Arms. I can take two. Okay. Um, three is just too much. It is. I, I for camp and for. On small water, typically there's a dive on small water. If I get three people on a trip, I can't see all three of them at the same time. I don't like it. Thank you. I want to have visual connection to everybody at the same time. And it gets really hard to do. So, um, so it's it's three packs, um, and you've got a relatively light pack. Mm -hmm. 
Um, this is one of the shelters that I hear that I use. Um, typically, you would sleep in that, and I would sleep under the park. You got that for yourself if you want. You want to listen to me, so I'm going to go find it. Okay. Yeah. So, I notice you don't have that on any of those. Is that not because it that. doesn't, I don't think size of the fish or it weight, it's just weight, right? weight too much. Right. You know, I don't need it. I'll say that too. I just don't need it. Okay. Yeah. If I'm guiding, I'll take them off. Okay. It's just me, I'm not taking them off. So you're in backpacking, but you're going backpacking, you're not carrying it in. Absolutely not. Okay. No. No. You find yourself bathing in the lakes very often? You all find the lakes getting down? No. It's too cold. <laughs> it's way too cold. No way. So you really don't need them. Okay. If I'm going to a high lake and that's all I'm doing, um, I'm, I don't take weight. Yeah, I'm just I'm wearing my backpack and boots. Yeah. Now I will tell you, I've gotten on high lakes before, and there's fish feeding 30, 40 feet beyond my best gas. And I have woods many times. I had turkey. Yeah. Now I've thought about taking pack wraps up before sometimes. Okay. Um I can see myself doing that. Yeah. It's 10 more pounds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought about that a lot. But uh, no, I'm not getting in 43 water. No way. <laughs> any, any, any other questions before I hand this back off to John? Thank you, Paul. Thanks, guys. All right, so now we're going to start with our raffle. For those of you that are on uh, Zoom, uh, I, I know that your slides were backwards. We had a uh, problem with the camera. Hopefully, you were able to read them okay. But, uh, all right, great. Before we start doing the raffle, uh, Bob, one of our longtime members of stuff is, is, uh, is moving. And uh, he did leave a couple of things over here for instance for free uh, a map of Colorado and a large folk trade poster of uh, native or attention to Colorado and stuff. So if you're interested in those, either one of those, uh, help yourself with those. Um, he's moving out of the state and says he didn't have room for any of that stuff to take with him. So. Anyway. Uh, another announcement, we had a trip going to the San Juan to fish the tailwater below Nano Reservoir, and we had a late cancellation. Uh, this is October, uh, Sunday, October 22nd, to Saturday, October 28th. So that's your five days of uh, actual fishing and then the travel days on both ends. We do have a spot available. If you're interested in going, let me know tonight. Okay, so I can uh, I can get some information from you and stuff because I need to finalize some things with the other participants on the trip. So if you're interested in going on that great trip, uh, we uh, did some great fish, and it's it's uh, right in the middle of Blue Wing Hatch uh, season down there. So there's a good activity with that. If you're for mid fishing, closer to the reservoir, closer to the dam, uh, there's some great mid fishing there. With Tiny, tiny missions if you're into that. Uh, uh, you know, you can catch a, uh, you know, you could probably catch a 24 inch fish on a size 20.